Do you believe in the existence of the devil? Um, this is not him. Um, this is actually Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Though I guess um, you know, some of you may feel that way about him. But uh, I show you his picture because uh, Scalia drew some attention this week for some comments he made in an interview that was published in New York Magazine last Sunday. The interviewer was asking him about his legacy and, and he was kind of brushing that off and said, when, well, when I'm dead and gone, I'll either be sublimely happy or terribly unhappy. And so the interviewer said, well, was asking, well, do you believe in heaven and hell? And Scalia said he absolutely did. And then he said, he, he added this, uh, he said, I even believe in the devil. And the interviewer said, you do? They were kind of taken aback. And he, he said, of course. Yeah, he's a real person. He says, hey, come on. That's standard Catholic doctrine. Every Catholic believes that. Scalia is a practicing Roman Catholic. And so the interviewer said, have you seen evidence of the devil lately? And here's his response. He says, you know, it's curious. In the Gospels, the devil's doing all sorts of things. He's making pigs run off cliffs. He's possessing people and whatnot. And that doesn't happen very much anymore. And the interviewer says, no. And, he's, and Scalia says, it's because he's smart. And the interviewer said, so what's he doing now? And he said, what, what he's doing now is getting people not to believe in him or in God. He's much more successful that way. Oh, well, that's an insightful comment. So what do you think about the devil? I think lots of times Christians can, can go to one of two extremes. We can either make too much of the devil and kind of be obsessed with the devil, or we can make far too little of him. We can act as if he doesn't even exist. Uh, and so as, as we've been talking about this series about uh, people who are always seeking the mystical, those with that kind of inclination, I think, can tend to become obsessed with Satan. And I suspect that for the author of, of Hebrews to the people he was writing to, there were probably some of those people who thought that way. Uh, we do know that in the first century there were Jewish exorcists, uh, many of whom were not all that successful. You remember the story in, in the book of Acts where they try to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, even though they didn't believe in Jesus? <laughs> so um, we've been doing this series called Good News for Mystic Seekers. And as the author goes through the first two chapters of the book of Hebrews, he addresses several what we might call mystical subjects. He talks about prophecy, he talks about angels, he talks about signs and wonders. We talked last week about a section where he talks about what I called a, a sacred brotherhood, a way of looking at, at, at the church, at believers. And so this last part of chapter two, as we finish off this section of the book, the author addresses the power of the devil. But just as, what, as the author has done all the way through the book, uh, he gives us a very balanced perspective. Uh, he, he, sets, he shows us the power of the devil in relation to the power of Jesus. And as he's done all the way through, he shows us that Jesus is so much greater. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. I encourage you to take a Bible and turn there with me. If you don't have one, there's one under the chair in front of you. And what we're going to see in this passage, uh, you'll find Hebrews there, I think around page 1,000 in those Bibles there. What we'll see in this passage is that Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 reveals how Jesus rescues us from the devil's power over three different parts of our lives. And so as we work through this passage this morning, I'd like to try to build for us a, a biblical theology of the devil. In my study this week, I, as I was saying, I tried to examine every reference in the Bible on the devil. Uh, the devil, the, the term devil is a New Testament term, and it means slanderer. When we turn back to the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word that's used is Satan, which means adversary. That's just the, the basic terminology there. But one passage in particular, the 14th chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, uses another name. In the King James, it says Lucifer, or the English standard that I'm reading from says day star. It simply means shining one. And that tells us something about the background and the history of Satan. Uh, those pass that passage, I Isaiah 14, and there's another one over in Ezekiel, uh, is they're speaking of human kings. 
Uh, in, in Isaiah, it's the king of Tyre, and in Ezekiel, it's the king of Babylon. But both passages speak of an angelic being behind uh, that human king. Uh, and it calls him uh, the, one of the chief angelic beings, a cherub, an archangel who grew proud and wanted to be exalted, wanted to be like God himself, and, and even led an angelic rebellion against God. And for that sin was cast down to earth uh, along with those other rebellious angels that we now call demons. And so ever since that event, Satan and his, his demons have worked to oppose God. So with that in mind, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 2, uh, and we'll start in verse 14 there and read what it says. Follow along with me. It says, Since therefore the children, it's talking about us, children of God, children of Christ, share in flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So the first area of our life that, the, that we see that the devil exercises power over is our health. Our health. Now, I'm not trying to draw any connection here between Satan and Obamacare. Um, <laughs> If you want to draw that connection, that's fine, but I'm not going there. Uh, but seriously, if, if, if we're honest, most of us would have to admit that we take an atheistic view of health issues. Follow me? We expect doctors to have all the answers. And we think that if, if, if they just work out the right treatment, then every sickness will just disappear. In, in technical terms, we could say that we approach sickness from a materialistic standpoint. And what I mean by that is that there's nothing more to this life other than, than, than material, than, than molecules, right? It's just a physical world. We don't allow that there's some spiritual component to things. We don't think that way. And so when we get sick, God doesn't even enter our minds. Uh, far less the idea of the, of the devil, right? That doesn't fit with our, our modern worldview. But we have to see that the devil does afflict us. Verse 14 says that the devil has the power of death. What does that mean? Well, you know, Jesus himself in John 8, 44 called the devil a murderer. What is that? How is the devil a murderer? Well, here's one way to think about it. Uh, we believe that God created human beings to live forever. When we read the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, that becomes clear. Death didn't come about until Satan enticed Adam and Eve to disobey God. Now, Adam and Eve made their own choice. Satan didn't force them to sin. But in a sense... Uh, and, and so death was God's punishment for Adam's sin. And so, well, how does Satan play into that? Think of it this way. He's, he's like a person who goes along and persuades some other individual to drink poison. Right? Now, that person made the choice to do it, to drink the poison. But I think even in a court of law, the person who persuaded him, we could say that person would be guilty of murder. And so in that sense, Satan is indeed a murderer. He bears responsibility for inflicting death upon the human race. In fact, every time one of us gets sick, every time someone we know dies, the blame for that can be traced ultimately back to Satan. Because right? he was the one who, who initiated that first temptation there in the garden. Now, having said that, I, I think there's more to Satan's power of death, as this passage calls it, than simply bearing responsibility. He can also afflict people directly. And we see that when we look back at the story of Job. Job is, is, the book of Job is really helpful in helping us understand what's going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. Job chapter 2, verse 7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord... And struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. 
Now, it's clear in, in the verses prior to that, if you read those first two chapters of Job, that Satan couldn't do that without God's permission. God has to allow him to do that. But Satan is the one who takes the initiative. He's the one who carries out the action. Now, in this story, God does forbid Satan from taking Job's life, but just the fact that God does that suggests to us that Satan does have the power to kill, the power of death. So that makes me wonder, does, is, is every sickness, uh, is it a result of demonic affliction? Are we supposed to see every time we get a cold or... Um, you know, I was struggling with allergies this weekend. Is that a demonic? Uh, is it demonically caused? Well, the Bible never says that. We can look throughout the Scripture. There's no indication of that. It's possible, I think, to say that some sicknesses are just the result of living in a fallen world that's decaying. But it is also possible that Satan is involved at times, maybe more often than we think. So what we can say for certain is that Satan bears that ultimate responsibility for sickness and death, and he may afflict people directly if God allows it. So the devil afflicts us, but Jesus died and rose again. That's the point that this, this passage makes. Look back at it, verse 14. It says, it talks about Jesus taking on flesh and blood. He became fully human so that he could experience death. Now, when you read the accounts of Jesus' death in the, in the Gospels, it doesn't say anywhere that Satan is directly involved in that. It doesn't say that Satan struck Jesus down. There's humans that are doing it, normal people. But if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, uh, there's this prophecy that God spoke to the serpent there in the garden in Genesis 3.15. As God spoke to the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So when Jesus was crucified, that in a sense was Satan bruising him on the heel. I mean, he, he did die, but he rose from the dead. It wasn't, a, it wasn't ultimately fatal. Uh, he died and came back to life. But at the cross, Jesus dealt Satan a fatal blow, a bruise to the head. And that's why here in verse 14, going back to Hebrews 2, it says that he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That's what was happening at the cross. Jesus was destroying Satan. He was taking away his power. But that leads us to ask this. If Satan is destroyed, then why do we still see sickness and death, right? Well, Jesus' death there on the cross was the decisive moment, was the decisive battle. Uh, the outcome of the war is certain. But the final victory won't come until Jesus returns. That's the ultimate thing that happens. Jesus casts out sin and death completely in his final victory over Satan. Now, having said that, there's an immediate benefit for us. And that's what this passage talks about in verse 15. Satan afflicts us, but Jesus died and rose us again so that we can be delivered from fear. Verse 15 talks about uh, fear of death as something that enslaves us. And it is burdensome, it's heavy, the, the thought of death, right? It, it's frightening, it terrifies us. And it's not just our own death, even worse, I think, is, is the loss of those we love. But the point of this is when Jesus died and rose again, Satan's power was broken. He op Jesus opened the way to eternal life. And what that does is it takes away the sting of death. We see that death is not final. We see that there's hope, there's something beyond death, that there's life, that there's the hope of resurrection. Satan can still afflict us, but we know that even if he strikes us down, even if we die, he doesn't win. That's the hope of, of the gospel. That's the good news that Jesus died for us. He gives us that hope. We don't have to fear death. 
Now that leads to another part of life where the devil seeks to exercise power. And it's, he seeks to exercise power over our relationship with God. Can Satan really disrupt our relationship with God? Does he have that ability? Well, if we're believers, he can't. But that doesn't stop him from trying. What the devil does is the devil accuses us. It's, it's as if, um, now God, God's all-knowing. Satan can't tell God anything that he doesn't already know. But he, it's as if he shines a spotlight on areas of sin in our life. He brings it up to God. He highlights it. Uh, we see this again going back to the book of Job, Job chapter 1. Here's oh, what, what happens there. It says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. See, that's, that's what Satan does. He, he brings accusations against us. What if? What if, God? What if you took away all these things that you've given this person? What would they do then? So Satan accuses us. And we, but look at verses 16 and 17 here in Hebrews 2. Going back there. It, Satan isn't mentioned here. But this whole idea of Satan's accusations are, are helpful background. I think it makes sense to, to understand that. Because look at verse 16. It says, For surely it is not angels that he, we're talking about Jesus, that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of of the people. So Satan accuses us, but the idea here in these verses is that Jesus defends us. This, that's, that's the effect, that's the idea of Jesus being our high priest. He represents us before the throne of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it calls Jesus our advocate. He's like our defense attorney. And according to verse 16 that we just read, he doesn't do that for angels. When angels fell, when they rebelled against God, they couldn't be reconciled with him. It was final. But you and I, when we sin, we can be reconciled with God. And it's interesting, verse 16 says he doesn't, um, he doesn't align himself, he doesn't help angels, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. And it says in verse 17 that Jesus had to be made like us in every respect. Specifically, in, in becoming a man, he didn't just become human. He became a Jew. He became a descendant of Abraham. Because that was part of God's plan. God had chosen the Jewish people to be the ones to receive uh, the Messiah. He was, he was working through them. And so that was a part of this for Jesus to become uh, Jewish. Now, if it were simply left to us, there would be no case for Jesus to plead. I, I don't have any, any deeds or actions that are good enough that would hold up in that heavenly court that Jesus could bring forward against Satan's accusations. We can't. We, we wouldn't stand there. We're guilty. But in verse 17, it says there, it has this theological word. It says in verse 17 that, he, uh, that Jesus might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make what? Propitiation for the sins of the people. The idea, is there, it, the idea there is that he offered a sacrifice. That's what propitiation is talking about. A sacrifice in our place that we deserve God's wrath. We deserve to fall under God's punishment. Um, and the author doesn't say at this point what the sacrifice was. We know that the sacrifice is, was Jesus himself, right, and dying on the cross. And he's going to talk about that later on in the book of Hebrews. But at least at this point, we see that as our high priest, 
He brings that offering. And that's what makes it possible for us to be forgiven. So I envision it this way, that in that heavenly courtroom, even at this very moment, I suspect, Satan is accusing us before God. Saying, yes, God, they're sitting there in church. But what if they were without that support? What would they do then? You know, what if you stripped away all those things that they rely on? Would they still trust you? And yet, as he does that, Jesus is there. And G when Satan accuses us, when he tries to highlight our guilt or bring something out, Jesus says, I, I've paid for that. I've saved that person. I've, I've made the atonement for their sin. He's our defender. And he defends our forgiveness. He makes it secure. And he's able to do that because he became human, because he became like us, so that he can represent us as our high priest. Now, there's one more area where the devil seeks to exercise power, not only over our health and over our relationship with God, but thirdly, over our conduct. Take a look at verse 18. It says there, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, it's about Jesus, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now again, there's no mention of the devil here, but it's implied because who's, who's doing the temptation? Right? It's, it's the devil that tempts us. He's like a master fisherman. Uh, you know, not that I'm saying anything about fishing for you guys that love fishing. I'm not trying to say that it's evil. But, um, but there are some similarities there, right? Satan lures us in. He tries to get us to take the bait. And there's always a hook. Now, we can't help. When we, we read this passage that talks about Jesus' temptations, we can't help but think about uh, the temptation he went through and Satan's involvement in that. Three of the four Gospels talk about how Satan came to tempt Jesus after he had been fasting in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. And if you remember, Satan tempted him to use his power to do three different things. To, to turn stones into bread because he was hungry. Uh, he tempted him to leap from a tall, the tall pinnacle of the temple so that angels would rescue him. And, and he tempted him to, to worship Satan in exchange for all the kingdoms of the world. Now, those temptations are ones that were specifically designed for Jesus. Most of those wouldn't get anywhere with us. Right? We don't have those powers that he does. But we can still say that the devil tempts normal, everyday people like us. Um, now, some people try to say that Satan can put thoughts into our mind. And I have to say that I don't see any biblical evidence for that. We don't find that anywhere in Scripture. Uh, those sinful thoughts that we have come from our own heart. Uh, Jesus talks about that, that our hearts are corrupt and, and all of these things flow within, from, within our hearts. So, uh, you know, we have, we're, we're our own source of trouble in that sense. But what we do see in the scripture is that Satan uses deception to tempt us. Wasn't that what he did back in the Garden of Eden? Remember the story how he convinced Adam and Eve that by not letting them eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that God was withholding something good from them. That was, was what he convinced them. Uh, so in, in John 8, 44, Jesus calls the devil the father of lies. The world is full of all kinds of false ideas that contradict what God says in his word, that undermine God's commandments, and some of those are overt, but some of those are very subtle. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It's the idea that Satan doesn't come out looking evil. That's not the way he presents himself to the world. He doesn't, he, you know, he's, he's not a biker. Uh, walking around in dark leathers, you know, with tattoos, and, and, and he doesn't look like this tough guy. No, Satan comes 
as an angel of light. He comes looking like someone very religious and holy and pure. I mean, that's, that's the real danger of Satan. He works through false religion. He wants to deceive us. Now, Scripture also shows us that Satan can manipulate circumstances to tempt us. We've already spoken of Job. That's what happened in his case. Uh, before Satan afflicted Job's health, as we talked about, prior to that, he brought all kinds of tragic circumstances into his life. You remember that? He brought a storm that, that knocked over a building onto his, Job's children and killed them. He, he brought in raiders that stole his, his flocks, his herds, all to, to tempt Job. Uh, Paul warns us in his letters about Satan using broken relationships to tempt us. In 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about, um, he talks about husband and, husbands and wives in their physical relationship, that if, 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 if they're, they abstain for too long, that they can be subject to temptation. In Ephesians, he talks about how when, when we're angry with someone and we, we don't deal with it, that it opens an opportunity for Satan. It's that idea, it comes out here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. It's that idea that he's always looking for that opportunity, for that chink in the armor. And so the devil tempts us. But getting back to our passage here, the point that Hebrews makes is that Jesus obeyed. Jesus perfectly followed God step by step throughout his life, even in the face of intense temptation from the devil. And the whole point of that, that, that this verse makes in verse 18, is that since Jesus obeyed, then he can come to our aid. He can help us to obey. How does he do that? Well, first of all, he sets an example for us to follow. He is the perfect example. I mean, particularly there in, in places like Matthew 4, where we see how he responds to temptation. He quotes from the scripture. He's ready. He has an answer. He, he, he recognizes temptation for what it is. He's, he's an example. But even more than that, Jesus gives us the truth to see through the devil's lies. That's what we have, particularly in the New Testament. That we have that biblical teaching that as we fill our minds with that truth and we practice discerning and seeing temptation, seeing through it, we have that truth to help us that Jesus has given us. But even going further than that, and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to help us. It's the idea that, that God's Spirit indwells us, fills us, to give us that ability to obey, to resist temptation. It tells us in James that when we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. That's a great encouragement. So the good news for mystic seekers is that though the devil can afflict us, Jesus died and rose again to deliver us from the fear of death. Though the devil can accuse us, Jesus, our perfect high priest, defends us so that we can be forgiven. Though the devil can tempt us, Jesus obeyed so that we can be helped to obey too. So think about today. How should you respond to what we've looked at? Maybe, maybe a, a good place to start. Maybe the whole idea of Satan is kind of far out for you. Maybe you thought that was a, a wacko idea. But um, when you look through the scripture, the teaching through the scripture is unavoidable, particularly from Jesus. And so maybe a good response for you today to what we've, we've considered is, is to read more in the scripture about Satan. Now, like I said, I'm not encouraging you to obsess about Satan or to fear him, 
Because that's not what the scripture teaches. It teaches us that Satan, or that Satan is, is there and he's real and he's dangerous, but that we have power in Christ. And we shouldn't be afraid. But we should be aware. Maybe another response today is maybe you've never trusted in Jesus personally. Maybe you're, you're not trusting him now. And you need to start. You know, it's, in order, like I said, in order to, to have Jesus as your defender, as your advocate, the one on your side, that all begins when you enter into a relationship with him by, by trusting in him. Not just a one-time thing, but a true commitment saying, I am going to rely upon you, Jesus, as my Savior. And that means I'm going to let him guide me. Now, I need that guidance, right? Satan is out there. He does want to draw me and he does want to tempt me. I need to rely upon Jesus every moment of every day. So have you started into that relationship? Now, we all have good times and bad times, times when we do better at trusting him and times when we, we lose focus. And so maybe that's part of this too, is just to, to regain that focus on trusting Christ. That's really the overall theme of, of the book of Hebrews, that we keep looking to him. But maybe for some of you, maybe you've never done that, and today's the day to, to begin to begin to trust Jesus, to, to receive salvation, to be forgiven of your sin, and to have that confidence that you don't have to fear death, that you can look forward to eternal life. Maybe that's a response. Maybe you need to change your view of death. It's so easy for us to really fear death rather than, than having this bold confidence as I look towards, I mean, a lot of us are, are afraid to even talk about anything related to death. We shouldn't be as believers. Because we know what, what awaits us. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Right? There was that sense of reality about it. Maybe we need to change the way we think about death. Or maybe it's practical, just dealing with the temptations that you'll face this week. And they, there certainly will be temptations that come our way, right? There always are. Are you seeking Jesus' help for that? Have you given in, given up? That verse we read, Jesus is there, he's able to help us. When we face temptation, are you relying upon him? Are you looking for, to him for that help? And Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.